Hello and welcome to this Kingdom Conversation. This is Business Unusual. We continue to talk about the giants and now we've gone through six giants. We are finally at the seventh, the final giant, the Jebusite. As we've been discussing, you know that as we go down with the giants, they're incremental. We see certain aspects that one giant affects how you deal with another. Now we've come to the culmination, to the ultimate of them all and why would the giant called the Jebusite be last? Yes, the Jebusite. Now, the meaning of the word Jebusite as we have done so far by breaking down the meanings of their names because that's what tells us their character, their functionality and how they operate. The Jebusite means to tread underfoot. They're also called the threshers. The threshers. Now, it's important to understand that the word thresh is a very symbolic word in the Bible. Generally, the thresh is supposed to be where you thresh wheat, meaning the pressure that is applied on mature wheat. First, it has to be mature. You don't, th you don't thresh wheat that hasn't grown to its fullness. That means this particular giant shows up when you're at your fullness, when you're supposed to be finally entering harvest, finally entering the fullness of your potential. That's the power of this particular giant. And threshing normally in the accurate model it's supposed to be where we separate the wheat from the chaff. And you see, if you read Psalms 1-4, it says something interesting, talking, after talking about the blessed man, who um, the, anything he puts his hands to do will prosper. An interesting thing, it says, in verse 4 says, the wicked are not so. They are like chaff that is blown away. Meaning, chaff is blown away. God strategized that when you are threshed correctly, the wheat remains. The thrash that has been removed um, under the floor becomes an interesting thing. You end up with something called the chaff. The chaff is the wickedness. The parts of you that are not necessary. The, 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 the bits of you that would not bring the fullness of what the wheat brings into your life. Now, this basic symbolism is going to help us interpret as we go down the road. Now, when you talk about the Jebusite spirit being threshers, it's interesting because on the outside it looks like an authentic thing. Because remember, threshing is what creates wheat. What says? Chaff. But when, it, when we talk about the Jebusite, theirs is different. When they thresh, they crush the wheat with the chaff. They completely dismantle and destroy even the wheat. So that when the wind blows, everything is lost. So after a while, the mingling, you can't tell where the wickedness ends and where the yeah. prosperity starts, where value starts, where faith starts. That's what this spirit is about. So, Jebusites are threshers. They destroy. They bring down. They tread you down until you're crushed. Crush your spirit. Crush your vision. Crush the pictures or everything you have. Now, as usual, before you jump to conclusion on who a Jebusite is, remember we are talking about ourselves. These giants are first within before they are without. The environment is only effective because internally we carry what is able to thrive in that environment. A fish is comfortable in water. So for the giant to be functional, not only is it an internal activity, but it's also the external environment that continues to give it strength to thrive. So everything that speaks to mind when you talk about the Jebusite usually will have the word control attached to it. Control. Control. And control in a negative context. Not control in terms of to steady something. But more control to, dis to destroy. Alright? So now there's a unique characteristic. Every giant has a unique characteristic over and above their name. The unique characteristic about this giant is that it was never completely removed from the land. And in fact, this giant dwells in Jerusalem. Yes, Jerusalem. That is interesting. It was never completely destroyed from the land. Never. Now that's interesting because in our understanding, if you look at the end of Joshua, the last chapters, it's talking about the land being divided. Joshua even goes and remembers the... the tribe, the half-tribe of Manasseh, who wanted the other side of the land, he sends them back, he gives them value, he gives them property. The back story has so many things going on there. But the interesting thing is, every tribe is given their allotment, which means two things. One, the enemy has been dealt with, 
And two, you've been given your allotment, but you have a warning. Don't let the enemy in your allotment arise again. Now this is interesting because as you go now, we go into Judges chapter 1, verse 21, we find a complete change. Something that if you don't pay attention to, you don't see this. Remember, they have been settled in the land. And Joshua has been commending how the Lord kept his word. And everybody has taken over land. But here's a little thing that happens in Judges that gives you an outcome that you didn't quite see in Joshua. Judges 121 says, And the tribe of Benjamin, however, failed to drive out the Jebusites who were living in Jerusalem. Important. The Jebusites live in Jerusalem. Please keep holding on to that concept. So however they fail to drive out the Jebusites who are living in Jerusalem. So to this day, the Jebusites live in Jerusalem among the people of Benjamin. Now you can take that statement with two ways of looking at it. One way, at the time of the writer, they were living together. Meaning, they were core uh, inheritors of Jerusalem. Instead of kicking them out, they began to live with them. Or, you can take it symbolically, that that is always going to be an intent of the Jebusite, to live alongside every tribe within Jerusalem. Now, you think the story ends there, and you think, okay, so we've heard about the Jebusites, that is the end. Oh, not so. Actually, remember, we said he's a unique giant. And where is this giant found in the entire land? In Jerusalem. So, it took David as king, imagine how many years later, several years later, probably a hundred plus, took David and his men to now confront this giant who had now become key to Jerusalem. And this is when David is finally ascending as king. God has established him. He's come from Hebron. He's got mighty men. The tribes have made him king. He is king. But here's a problem. There's one place until you are said you're not truly king over Israel. And that is Jerusalem. So, unfolding events become very interesting. Second Samuel chapter 5, verse 6 to 12. Now David has arrived. He's got his mighty men, he's got his captains, he's got the captains of Saul. I mean, David has an army which literally we remember says, and the armies of David were like the armies of the Lord. David is ready. But with all that, there's a place called Jerusalem. And at that time, it has a strange name. It's called Jebus. It actually belongs to the Jebusites. Second Samuel 5, 6 to 12. And the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. Note, the king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, who's living in Jerusalem. The Jebusites. The Bible says the inhabitants of the land. They dwell in Jerusalem. These are Jebusites. David is now ascending, yet there's a stronghold being kept by a company of people called the Jebusites. It's interesting in every other part of the nation. By the way, history tells us the Jebusites were not as huge in number as, as any of the other tribes, but they were quite capable in terms of control and rulership. So they are running the land. They are the ones in Jerusalem. David has to deal with them. And they speak to David, and this is what they say. We are still in 2 Samuel 5, verse 6. You shall not come in here, but the blind and the lame will repel you, thinking David cannot come here. Verse 7. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. That is the city of David. Interesting. You see, on one hand, they clearly say, you are not coming here. The blind and the lame will resist you. Yet immediately within that same context, the Bible says, nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion and called it the city of David. See, the nature of the city takes on the nature of whoever is ruling. It's now the city of David. Now David said on that day, now verse 7 gives you the conclusion. Verse 6 tells you their reaction, who they are. Verse 7 tells you the conclusion. But verse 8 kind of gives us a clue on how they were taken down. Now David said on that day, Whoever climbs up by the way of the water shaft and defeats the Jebusites, and it, it's in, it then says the lame and the blind who are hated by David. I always want to say this. 
In the first place, the Jebusites say he'll be repassed by the lame and the blind. In the second place, David calls them the lame and the blind and defeats the Jebusites, the lame and the blind, who are hated by David's soul. Now, immediately, in scripture, if you know David's character and nature, you know who David has been called, you know there is no way David can hate the lame and the blind. So, this is not saying the lame and the blind are a problem in the kingdom. It basically tells you that Jebusites exhibit a spirit called the lame and the blind. They carry it and they infect others with it. That's what they even said, we will send the lame and the blind. And David says, yeah, I know that. You are all the lame and the blind. So that tells us that the lame and the blind here has a meaning that we have to take time to look at because this is the key to bringing down the Jebusite. And David said, whoever brings them down, he shall be chief and captain. Therefore they say the blind and the lame shall not come into the house. Meaning, post this reality, David actually made it a requirement that the lame and the blind should not be allowed to access the house of God. Why? Because when they do that, we have problems. Then David dwelt in the stronghold and called it, called it the city of David. And David built all around from Milo and inward. So David went on and became great. And the Lord of God of hosts was with him. Then Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David and cedar trees and carpenters and masons and they built David a house. Verse 12. So David knew that the Lord had established him as king over Israel and that he had exalted his kingdom for the sake of his people Israel. Now you look at a few other factors in this conversation. One, David gave us strategy for taking these people on. He says, though I hate these guys, though I know they are trying to stop me from this stronghold, Whoever goes by way of the water shaft and brings them down will be made captain. In fact, if you go on to read, we are told Job is the one who did this. And if you check later, Job became the head of David's army. The principle is this. What is the water shaft? Now, um, historia, ancient historians will tell you that, that what was then the city of Jerusalem was a stronghold that had no access from any side. There was actually no way to take that city. It was a stronghold. That's why it's called the stronghold. But there was a, and then it was fed by only one waterway. It was known as the water shaft or the water tunnel. So David is trying to tell you, one, this city, Jerusalem, we all know Jerusalem represents believers. By now we should know that. It says this city is fed by one river, not many rivers. That's why you remember when you talk about Babylon, you talk about the rivers, plural, of Babylon. But when you talk about this, you talk about one river. Meaning, the proceeding word, what is God saying that gives life to us at this time? Whoever proceeds through that path, or what we at TCC call the proceeding word, that person will be able to take down the Jebusite and shall be made captain. Meaning, you shall enter a place of functional capacity because of that word. And you'll have brought down the Jebusite. Now, we're going to see that after that, strange things happen. David is so established that even what would have been his enemies, Tyre, really, Babylon, begins to provide and begins to bring resources. He has access to resources that are now in the hands of so-called, today, the world system that belongs to the kingdom, and now they bring it to help build. That's interesting. And the Bible says that David realized that the Lord had established him as king. He had been anointed as king. He had been made king. He was now being established as king. Very important. There's a place where you're anointed. The place where you're recognized. There's a place where you're established. So David is now established. And it's interesting, he became the king, not of Jerusalem, but the king of Israel. Whoever takes on the Jebusite ultimately rules his jurisdiction rules in the realm in which God has established him. So, the blind and the lame are very key to understanding David's takeover of Jerusalem. And we need to begin to just unpack the meaning of these two words. Because if we understand this phrase, the blind and the lame, we'll be able to understand how the Jebusite operates. Because that's the key to the Jebusite. So remember, the blind and the lame means that the Jebusite, anybody functioning, from the spirit of the Jebusite, or anybody affected 
by anybody functioning from the spirit of the Jebusite has blindness and lameness. So now let's begin to look at what would be the symptoms, some of the ways to understand lameness and blindness. And we know we draw this from the character of the Jebusite. Remember, they are threshers. They crush. So one of, and, and by the way, as we begin this, can we go back and remember that every time we are dealing with these realities, we're talking about a personal position, we're talking about you as an individual, we're talking about how you affect people, and we're talking about how people affect you. So this works both ways. It can be you who is actually functioning like this. And many times it is. Just at different levels. I mean, we're talking about this could be on, on a friendship level. This could be at a relational level. This can be in marriage. This can be in business. This can be family. This can be a spiritual organization, a corporate environment, even government. This is the reality that when you're dealing with these giants, they are found in our day-to-day -day lives. So one of the first characteristics of this giant is walking all over other people. Literally walking over people, meaning always treading people, crushing them, bringing them down, dominating them, being the one who is, who is at the top and everybody must be down. This is the same picture. Listen, the Jebusite was responsible for slavery, was responsible for most of the atrocities we know, and slavery in any form, by the way. Not just the slave trade, slavery in any form. All right? Now, what you'll see as usual, these symptoms of the Jebusite kind of are layers of each other driving each other. Because anyone who walks over other people, you're already aware that the second symptom would be in consideration of other people's feelings. You don't consider them at all. But they don't matter. How what you do affects them does not matter. And why doesn't it matter? The third thing. Self-righteousness. You are right. They are wrong. So whatever you do to them doesn't matter. And you see, the problem is that, remember, please, we are dealing with a principality that lives in Jerusalem. I know this may happen in everywhere you go in life, but we are focusing in Jerusalem. Because this Jebusite was found in Jerusalem, in an environment that is supposed to be an environment of the kingdom, supposed to be believers. Why do you reach this place where you have self-righteousness. Because self-righteousness, the third thing, is always driven by the fourth thing, self-interest. Self-interest. You see, if you have an interest, you must find a way to justify the illness, that interest. Let, let's take the slave trade, for example. The primary interest of slave trade was free labor, self-interest. How do we get people to work in the cotton fields, do whatever we want, or Egypt, build the city without paying anything. That's self-interest. You must have self-righteousness. You must come up with a doctrine or a thought or a concept that makes those people lesser. If they are lesser, then you don't have to care about their feelings. After all, they are half human. They are not that important. And if you do that, you can walk all over them. So you see, walking all over others, is because of in consideration of their feelings, which is born out of self-righteousness, and this is driven by self-interest, which is the fourth thing that you see. Now, let's look at some other aspects, what I would call the other symptoms of this giant. The fifth one I've put down is deliberately putting people down. Down-dressing people. This can happen at a corporate level, as the boss, in life, in marriage, in relationships, in school, it just doesn't matter where it is. But always putting people down. In other words, you're always bringing them down. There's no time you'll discuss anything about anyone that puts them in a good light. There's no time anybody can do anything that you acknowledge. This can happen, even in parenting. You don't even see the value of your children and what they do. You're always putting people down. Why? It comes from self-interest. You're driven by the fact that it is taking attention away from you. Remember the Hivite? They work together. In a place where you're now you're dressing people down, you're always, you might like embarrassing people. 
shaming people. And why would you do that? Because you want to elevate yourself. You see, we don't put people down and just want to elevate ourselves. I, I'll say this, one of the things we discussed in marriage when we're explaining the difference between function and role. And how roles can create for men a very dangerous position. Where, instead of seeing yourself as one who creates an environment for your wife to thrive, by the way, or vice versa, but you're one who now gets intimidated, and we call it the dwarf mentality. The dwarf mentality means, as long as I'm taller than you, I'm big. The problem is, I don't have to grow. But anytime you try to grow, I bring you down, so I can always maintain my height. So I'm not growing, but neither do I want you to grow. That's a jebusite. Not striving to become, but making sure nobody becomes. Promoting your own views. That's the next thing that jebusite does. Above everyone else's. So no matter what anybody else sees or talks about, if it's something that sounds like it may bring value, you immediately will bring down yours. Guys, these things are not easy. Sometimes this is surgery. Sometimes just the way we are. We don't sometimes realize how much we want our view to be the view. There's nothing wrong with your view being the view. But there can there be a way that it incorporates everybody else's view. And the question is not my view or your view. Within the context of the kingdom, which view most accurately represents the preceding word, where God is sending us. So it's not about opinions. Listen, somebody once said, and I still remember the statement, everybody is entitled to their own opinions, but not everybody is entitled to their own facts. See, your facts will always try to reinforce your opinion. So you can have an opinion, even if it's a differing opinion, but don't recreate facts so that your opinion has wins. Facts must remain the same, even with your opinion. The seventh symptom is a worrying one. It's called legalism and power play. Legalism and power play. Now, legalism comes from this. It comes from the place where you will only enforce legality on a matter that promotes your cause. In other words, you can go into scripture and only find the scriptures that seem to agree with you, your opinion. You already want an outcome. You've already decided what you want. You've already reached the place where you, you feel, this is me, this is what I want, I don't care who else gets hurt. But now, the only way I can reinforce this is I'm going to find a scripture that agrees with this position. And suddenly you become very legal with that and you begin to use it for power playing. Power playing simply means you now, that legal position gives you power. Now this is true even in culture. You can get a cultural position and as long as it serves you, at that point, you, 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 you promote it as if it is the truth and then you make it the legal and the basis. In other words, nobody can argue outside this. And that's why many times they would try to be legal with Jesus and he would ask a, another question that opens up the parameter to put the legality in context. So legality is only within context. You can't say it's legal for the sake of legal. In other words, you can't take one rule that applies in a particular context and try and enforce it in a different context just because it then benefits you. Yet, you're not willing to live in the wholeness of that context. That's why Paul said, they that live by the sword shall die by the sword. In other words, if you want to live by a particular rule, then you must be sure to make sure if you want to enforce it, it can be enforced on you also. That's the only way it works. So they like power playing, they like being in control of everything. Now, sadly, the strength of the Jebusite spirit, the higher you move in leadership, the stronger its capacity, the stronger its reach, the stronger its influence. So you'll find that the Jebusite is found a lot in what I may call groupings, people groups, whether social or religious, or whether just friends, groups, because the Jebusite wants to control, not to lead the group, to control the group. 
And remember, everything we've mentioned so far is part of the tools that Jebusite uses to control the group. And sometimes this form of control comes out in various forms. It comes out in the humiliation of others. That's another aspect of the Jebusite. Humiliation, always shaming people. Always. And the sad thing about this is that when you use humiliation as your strategy, you find yourself in a place where you must always find something wrong with people. You never see anything right. Yet, remember that the Jebusite lives in Jerusalem. Therefore, the Jebusite always gives the, the false nature that while well, uh, he's helping. So the humiliation is not always so overt. Sometimes it is, but in many places it is not. But remember, it is connected to legalism. It's connected to all the other things we are seeing. It's connected to self-interest. It's connected to self-righteousness. All those are part and parcel of this spirit. And, and the Jebusite enjoys, gloats, is proud of having control over other people. You see, I, I personally find it very distasteful for people to follow me because they fear me. I find it absolutely distasteful that somebody is actually, um, and, and it's sad, in many places, you realize the reality of that fakeness because both of you are working under the Jebusite. The one who is enforcing this fear that are the Jebusite and the one who is serving because of the one to fit into this context is still under the Jebusite. And so the Jebusite has this arrogance and pride in their ability to control people. In fact, they thrive on it. They, 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 literally, it's, it's their oxygen. The ability that they can control people. And this is, this is scary because this kind of mindset is found in a, uh, let's talk about uh, spiritual environments. If this is found in a spiritual environment, remember I'm saying, apply it anyway. Apply it in your marriage. Apply it in your friendships. Sometimes you say you're not part of any group of people because there's no one to control. Sometimes you say you can't fit into any environment because unless they do things your way, you don't want it. So it looks like it's their fault. The truth is, you're the one who can't function in that environment. On the other hand, there's others who've been so inflicted, you now say, because someone did this to you, you can't relate with people. Now, you are exhibiting the Jebusite spirit. In the same way. Because you are not. You are blind and lame. We'll be talking more about that. Because someone else made you blind and lame. So now everybody must suffer from your blindness and lameness. That's a principle. So, in one place where this is prevalent, especially within Jerusalem, and you know Jerusalem is a metaphor for believers, is spiritual blackmail. Now, spiritual blackmail comes in various forms. One of the most cruel forms of spiritual blackmail is false prophecy. False prophecy where people are kept in bondage because some prophetic word said, if they do not tow a certain line, they'll have a curse. Some prophetic words said, if they leave a certain environment, community, and join another, they are cursed. That is the Jebusite in full throttle. Some people are in bondage because somebody came to prophesy in a community and told you, if you leave this community, you will never be blessed. God's blessing is not tied to any community, not TCC, not any community globally. It's tied to his word. And that word is functional, even if you leave the community. Another aspect of spiritual blackmail is the idea, and I'm talking to those on the pulpit, like myself, to be very careful not to mistake them as our sheep. They are his. They're just shepherds. And shepherds don't give birth to sheep. So let's not assume they belong to us. God has given us oversight. He hasn't given us control. Let's not mistake those two terms. We do not determine who can marry who? We do not determine where people can live. We do not determine what people can wear. Listen, if somebody asks for advice, give it genuinely. But do not be the one who determines anybody's life. The Bible is clear, even in Moses' day, God said, choose ye this day. So yes, while the Bible is clear cut on what God's intents are, the Bible is not a manipulative or controlling book. God does not threaten anybody into heaven does not threaten anybody with anything. 
God doesn't have a problem. He doesn't have a, a poor ego that if people do not choose him, he will be offended. That's not the idea. We're supposed to present him accurately so people choose him. That's the difference. So spiritual blackmail, the idea that if you leave my environment, you, things will not work out for you. Listen, if you're in TCC and you've ever felt that, we free you. That is not the kingdom. It is the word that keeps you functional. It is what God said, and that word is true, even if you leave the community. Every prophetic word you receive, even if you, God forbid, never talk to us again, you are still functioning under that word. It was God's word, not our word. It was God speaking to you, not us. So let nobody, but any prophetic word you receive that causes any form of fear or control. Listen, the Bible says manipulation and control is as the sin of witchcraft. That would be witchcraft. Meaning, you are afraid to step out and do this because a word said if you do this, God is going to punish you. Listen, God doesn't have prophecies that are filled with doom. There are many false prophets with massive congregations that keep keeping people with doom. Don't keep any audio on doom. Keep people on life. Now this is the same. You can blackmail somebody in your marriage. You can blackmail somebody in many ways, in your friendships. If you leave us, you will lose out. Do you know who we are? Do you know our networks? If you're not part of us anymore, we will destroy you. That is the Jebusite. Nobody has to be part of anything. But people need to be part of something. Big difference. Nobody has to, but people need to. But what you need to be a part of must increase life. If it, listen, the Bible is clear. Perfect love casts out fear. Because fear has to do with bondage. So that's the principle here. Don't have this spirit. One of the aspects of it is making others feel small and unworthy. Any environment that keeps telling you you are small, you are useless, you are a nobody, that is the Jebusite spirit. God did not create anybody who is unworthy. Anybody who is small and anybody who is useless. In fact, many people have the misunderstanding that they are that. Why? The Jebusite got you. Jebusite has affected your idea. You have no ability to see who you really are. So please, do not use legalism or any form, if you're in authority anywhere. Don't play between false spirituality, sp false authority, and use legality. If you're in any relationship, do not use legality. Legality means, you know, if you stop being my friend, you'll lose one, two, three. No, that's not how it works. Let's live in a place of freedom. Jerusalem does not require any more Jebusites. It's time to get them out. So we have to stop enforcing dependence by creating... The, the reason we open up the word and we share the proceeding word with you and we ask you, what have you heard? What are you going to do about it? We don't tell you, have you heard this word? This is what you must do about it. No. Because we don't want to make you also dependent. We want you to live free of the word. Remember I talked about manipulation and control. That is manipulation of emotions. Now, this can work both ways. Don't take advantage of people emotionally or with your emotions. In other words, there are people who are vulnerable. They've let you know who they are. They've opened up to you. They are your friend. Out of trust, they let you see some of their weaknesses. Don't use it for power play. Don't use it for manipulation. Don't use it for control. Don't threaten them with exposure. That is what is known as the Jebusite. Functioning at any level. And this truth is a truth for you whether you're a pauper or a prince. This truth is true for you, irrelevant. Don't use, and then on the other hand, don't use your own infirmity for manipulation. You know what happened to me, you know what they did to me, that's why you're treating me like this, Jebusite. Nobody treats you in a particular way unless you accept to be treated that way. That's a difference. Let's be free of this. And of course, keywords. All these activities that I've mentioned are connected to two key words. Blindness and lameness. 
What does blindness represent for us in this environment? Blindness is having no insight. It means on an individual level, when I am the one who is the propagator of this spirit, then I have no insight into people's lives or who they are or where they matter or what's important. So I will crush them because I don't see any value. I have no sight of their future. I don't even want them to have a vision. I don't see anything important about them. That's why I'm able to crush them because that's the one side. The other side is I see them as a threat to my future, as a threat to who I am. That's all I see. It's interesting that we talk about how an evil spirit, remember? An evil spirit possessed Saul. The Bible doesn't say this, so don't say the Bible said it. This is my opinion. I believe it was the Jebusite. Why? Because when this evil spirit possessed Saul, he attacked no one but David. Interesting. It was just an evil spirit that would have said he's throwing spears at everybody. Why particularly David? Because David becomes a threat to his throne. David becomes a threat to his future. David becomes a threat to everything. So the Jebusite will always go after David. Why? David is living on a prophetic word. God has already said he will be king. It's so clear even Jonathan knows the prophecy. Yet, what does Saul want to do? Kill him. That's what it does to you. That's what the Jebusite does. Always trying to kill your vision. Kill who you are. Kill where you're supposed to ascend to. Kill who you're supposed to become. That's what you do to a slave, by the way. You kill their future. You, they, you, you disconnect them from their family. You remove them from anything that empowers them. You get rid of their name. You get rid of their history. You give them no vision for the future. That is why, unfortunately, the early church in the Pentecostal era inherited a lot of post-slave songs. What are the post-slave songs? It won't be long. We'll soon be leaving here. It won't be long, we'll be going home. Why? The slave recognizes that where they are is not their home. But at the same time, because there is no potential of freedom, home must be heaven. And so I became the core singing that finally, across the bridge, there will be no more sorrow, no more pain. We need to get out of here. Jebusite spirit. The impact of the Jebusite is to have a people living in Jerusalem who have only one vision, heaven. To get out of here as soon as possible because there is no future here. And what puts them in that condition? So they have no condition for the future. Their interest is heaven. Their greatest dreams, their greatest visions, their greatest understanding of splendor, of greatness, of mansions, of anything, cannot be in the earth, it is in the heavens. Yet, they are in Jerusalem. And what keeps them there? Lameness. Lameness is a picture, in this particular scripture, is a picture of both legs being unable to walk, being unable to stand, being ashamed of who you are, having no path to follow because I don't have the capacity to follow any path anyway. So no matter what you tell me, it means nothing. They have no ambition. The inability to move, they are paralyzed. There is nothing to live for. Yet, they are in Jerusalem. So, all you can do is believe for a handout waiting for exit. All you can do is believe for somebody. That's why the man called beautiful at the gate wanted a handout. He didn't want legs. He's not only in Jerusalem. He's at the gate called beautiful. He is next to the temple or the place where God's name is, and yet he's been there 38 years. Jebusite got you. That's the seriousness about it. So the reality, as you continue, is that even after David took Jerusalem, but it was called Jebus before that, the Jebusites were not utterly destroyed. Even after David took the city, they still lived among them. Now this is incredible. This, this giant is relentless. David has taken up the stronghold. David now is ruling within the city. Yet, this giant still lives among them. And how do we know? An interesting story is told. Now to give you a background to the story, 
David is in a situation now, he knows the Lord has established him, but even in that establishment, there are certain things that are, that are going wrong in the nation. And David actually realizes that the key to this, and God gives him the solution, is to actually build an altar. And in that altar, later became the site of the temple. So you see the keys. You see how the story is now beginning to unfold. Yet something is strange in this activity. At the time when David needs to now go to that site, which, by the way, till today is a battle across the nations, even today Jerusalem is still the home of three religions, all claiming the same spot. So the Jebusite always dwells in Jerusalem. It's a principle. All right? So, a strange thing happens, and David has to go and purchase, literally purchase. David has taken the city. David has taken the stronghold. But how can it be that David needs to buy? And from who? The place where this can be done. Second Samuel, chapter 24, verse 20 to 25. When Arauna looked and saw the king and his officials coming toward him, he went out and bowed down before the king, and his face with his face to the ground. Arauna said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? To buy your threshing floor, David answered, so I can build an altar to the Lord that the plague on the people may be stopped. Arauna said to David, Let my lord the king take whatever he wishes. And offer it up. Here are oxen for the burnt offering. Here are threshing sledges and ox yokes for the wood. Verse 23. Your majesty, Arauna gives all these things to the king. Arauna also said to him, May the Lord your God accept you. So Arauna lives in Jerusalem and he's talking about the Lord the king's God. Not his God. Verse 24. But the king replied to Arauna, No, I insist on paying you for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen and paid 50 shekels of silver for them. David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord answered his prayer on behalf of the land and the plague on Israel was stopped. Now, you need to understand something very strange. I didn't read the story from the beginning, but in the beginning, Arauna is actually clearly described. It says, Arauna the Jebusite. Interesting. A Jebusite, and Arauna was a king, by the way, a Jebusite owns the threshing floor. The ultimate position required for God to respond to the people. Isn't that very interesting? David has taken the city. In other words, the Jebusite, hmm. let's go a bit into history. There's a major argument among historians, not necessarily biblical historians, but historians who look at the Bible from a historical perspective. That it is possible that there was no real battle to take Jerusalem, that there was a negotiated takeover. Why? Because the argument is, how do you find David buying land from a city he has captured? Now the symbolism to me is more important. The symbolism is this. One, the Jebusite owns the threshing floor. That alone should wake us up. Remember the name Jebusite means threshers. Threshers. So the Jebusite is still busy threshing. In fact, it's interesting that he actually offers the tools. He says the threshing floor, I'll give you for free. In fact, I'll give you the wood, I'll give you the oxen, everything required to thresh. What is he threshing? Why is the Jebusite owning a threshing floor? Remember where we began? A threshing floor is a metaphor in scripture for when the word is brought, processed, made clear, understood, accepted, lived on. That's why even in the future, Paul speaking about the people who work in the kingdom talks about do we thresh not in hope, meaning what is threshing? 
Threshing is taking the word, separating the wheat from the chaff, and the word coming into your life, separating the wheat from the chaff. And we've also seen that the chaff is wickedness, what is not needed in the kingdom, so that you can proceed and function. That tells you something is so interesting about this particular functionality. That means the Jebusite is controlling the key. The Jebusite takes the wheat, takes the word, takes everything, crushes it, and crushes whoever, so that you cannot walk in this reality. So David is given a strategy by God. He says, we must get the threshing. We must pay the price. What does that mean? It means, when a word is given to you, don't accept the Jebusites free. Free means leapfrogging you to the so-called you hear a word then giving you a way out that is easier, that doesn't require you changing. Doesn't require the word working through you and threshing you and removing what is not required to allow you to function. But offers you an outcome. Don't worry, this is going to work. You don't need to get involved. God will do it. But while that is going on, the same Jebusite is crushing you and making sure you will never make it. So the first part of how the Jebusite works with you is to make you a free offer. After being with you for a while, he systematically begins to change. Remember, it's the same threshing floor. So it thinks like you think it's being threshed for your good. It's not. In fact, this is so symbolic because I, I almost can say, drawing from this, that a conversation between Jesus and Peter begins to make sense. It says, the enemy, the devil has asked to sift you like wheat. Who has asked for you? The thresher. But I have prayed that your faith will not fail. Meaning, in the threshing, I did not stop the threshing. In the threshing, let your faith stand. Let it bring value to you. The word has to be threshed for us to have reality. And we have to be threshed by the word for us to function. The Jebusite tries to stop you from getting the right threshing and puts you in the wrong threshing. It looks like the thresh. Eventually, it destroys you. Let me use something more personal that you can inter interact with to understand this same spirit. Try and use an example to bring it. Think of how debt works. Debt makes an offer of freedom. Debt in any kind says, look, you get this, this is your way out. Once you've borrowed, things are going to be easy. Well, this is going to work. That's how that is going to work. That's how things are going to go. This is how this is going to environment. The minute you take that on, before long you discover that became bondage. Before you discover it's controlling everything in your life and every promise made was a lie. Now this is applicable anyway. This is applicable in a cultic environment where you tell people that they're coming here to get the greatest breakthrough in their lives. When they step in there, they get the great, greatest bondage in their life. This is applicable in marriage. Oh, come into this situation, everything is going to work out without the process, without the way of the water shaft, without the correct threshing. The end story is you've lost your identity, you've lost hope, you've lost who you are, you've lost how things need to work for you, you've been under the Jebusite spirit. I know the, the women unusual community have been dealing, Susan just didn't tell you, that you're dealing with the thresher. When you talk about the girl inside being woken up, it was dealing with the Jebusite has been busy. Threshing, destroying, bringing you down. Across the nations, the thresher is working through a movement called feminism. The idea is to thresh, to bring men down. Same principle. The thresher will work in men over women, it will work in women over men. Same principle. The idea is this. Wheat must never come out of here. And no one, the kingdom must never be established. That is the key. So this is how you begin to understand what the treasure does. So David says something, listen, I'm not a fool. I'll not take it from you for free. You will determine the threshing processes. You will determine the timings. You will determine the outcomes. And before long, I'll have no crown and no nation. So what? I buy at the price. I pay the full price. What is my instruction today? I follow it to the letter. Go backwards. David was following an instruction from the Lord. Go buy. That's a principle. Go take charge. Today, for some of you, your instruction, you've seen this, I think, 16 things I mentioned. 
Pick the core ones, pay the price. Get the treasure out. Take that flow, the same flow, the same capacity. I used to control people, I will now empower people. Take the same threshing flow. Turn it around and let it do what it was meant to do from the beginning. I have people have been placed in my environment, they're in bondage, they need to be freed. I'm in a relationship, in marriage, I've been the thresher. I now need to change that environment. I need to pay the full price and buy this land from the Jebusite and get him out and begin to do what this was meant to do. That's the picture that goes with it. You know, the process of going through a proceeding word is the accurate threshing. The inaccurate threshing is using the preceding word as an excuse to destroy others. The Jebusite is in Jerusalem, by the way, at the threshing floor, meaning before a temple stood there, the Jebusite had a threshing floor there. That's an incredible concept right there. Always sits in the throne, always sits on the same position, always sounds. In fact, the Jebusite primarily is a ruler, is a king. The Jebusite primarily keeps people in bondage, and yet the Jebusite primarily attempts to change God's voice to his voice, so he sounds like God. Can, listen, can justify. Slavery was justified by a scripture. Racism was justified by a scripture. Let me tell you, even domestic violence can be justified by a scripture. Anything can be justified by a scripture. That's what the Jebusite does. It's a primarily religious spirit, very powerful. Tries to supersede the voice of God, eventually replace the name of God. Remember, that's why God says, go to the land and find the place I choose to place my name. That means you must be able to discern between where God has placed his name and where Jebus resides. Because they could look alike. How do you know the difference? Easy. Look at the outcome of the threshing. I don't know why people like studying the preacher instead of studying the outcome. Interact with the outcome. Interact with the people who've been part of that environment. That's why we normally say, in a marriage, speak to the other spouse and hear their real position. Because that's the outcome point. That's where the spirit manifests. What's the difference? You're in a community, in a group, Check the people's quality of life. Check their standard. You will know whether the Lord has placed his name there or the Jebus has placed his name there. They could be using the same script, but with a different outcome. So, Jesus had to encounter this particular giant. Remember this giant dwells in a city, dwells in Jerusalem, operates and always dwells among the people. So, a situation arises where Jesus now is speaking about Jerusalem, the city. But in his speakings and his response to the city, he's identifying who has taken over the Jebusite. So, three things he does. One, he identifies the problem. Then he weeps over the city. Then he prophesies judgment over it. So, if you read Matthew 23, 37 to 39, it's almost word for word, Luke 13, 34 to 35, both dealing with this environment. So I'm reading from Matthew 23, 37. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Already people, this is an oxymoron. How do you say Jerusalem kills prophets? I thought Babylon kills prophets. Babylon just captures them. Jerusalem, when the Jebusite is in charge, kills them. And stones those who are sent to her. Listen, Jesus is giving us a powerful insight. He says, when the Jebusite is in charge, and we all know who was in charge of Jerusalem in Jesus' time. Wasn't it the religious leaders and Herod? So you can see how the Jebusite works. They live together. He who kills the prophet. One, the one who kills the prophets, the prophetic word, also the proceeding word that's supposed to bring change, is shut down. That voice is killed and another voice takes over. Yet the same Jerusalem Jesus is talking about, all the rituals are being run. The temple is functional. Everything is operational. Yet he's saying, 
It's killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent. Meaning, anyone who brings the proceeding word, anyone who brings the prophetic word, anyone who brings the voice of God into the city is attacked by Jerusalem, where God is supposed to be speaking, where God is supposed to have his name. How often, he says, I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. How long I wanted to protect you? But you are not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What I think is crucial about this scripture number one is that Jesus says something very important. He said, blessed until you say, until you recognize the sent ones. Blessed is he who comes in the name. He didn't say, blessed is he who has the name. Who comes in the name of the Lord, the sent one, the one who carries. There will always be a sent one. There will always be one who carries the prophetic voice and the sound of a sent one. There will always be one who brings the reality of what this kingdom is supposed to be doing. There's always going to be a company of people that are sent within Jerusalem. And he says, until he recognized that and said, blessed is he, meaning he brings glad tidings, he brings blessing. Until you recognize that, the Jebusite will continue to rule you and to bring destruction, will continue to crush you and to trample you underfoot. So, the Jebusites always want to clean kill the voice. Now the remedy is simple. We spoke about it recently. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, but how can they call in whom they have not heard? How can they hear in whom they have not? Blessed is he. Blessed is he. Blessed is he. I'll say that three times. Yea, even four. Proverbs says. You have to come to the place where you fully understand what God is saying that he will send one to you. The one he sends to you will, in other words, everybody has a priest in office. Everybody, no matter where you are, has one who comes in the name. And when he comes in the name, God tells you, if you go there, you will find me. When you say blessed is he, the word blessed is he is not that you're blessing him. It's that you say what he carries is blessed. What he brings is blessed. The prophetic and the proceeding word of the sent one is the key to the Jebusite. So do not become one of the blind or lame who try to stop David. Now the blind or lame, now I'll give it in almost two or three metaphors. The blind or lame who try to stop David could be your infection of the Jebusite which is stopping your David, you, your ability to rise up and take over what God said. So you could be one of those who has the excuse, but people have been down treading me. Oh, I was kept this. I was manipulated. I was taken advantage of. Now you've become blind and lame. You no longer see your vision. You no longer see who you're supposed to be. And therefore, the David within you is trapped. Every time the David within you tries to rise, you throw a javelin. Try to kill him. Saul lost his entire kingdom because his assignment was to deal with the Amalekites. He changed it and he began to pursue David completely confused. The Jebusite has you pursuing David instead of dealing with the Amalekites. Amalekites rob you of everything. That's what God deals with. So, if you've been the one that is causing people to be blind and lame, it's time to stop. Ask the Holy Spirit, reveal this to me. Let me see if this is who I am. That I may stop and be healed. I'm willing to pay the price. I'll pay the full price for the threshing floor. I'll allow kingdom threshing. I have experienced the Jebusite's threshing. I'm done with that. I want the threshing of the kingdom that will bring me to the place where I shall fully say, for the Lord has established me as king over my Israel. Whatever jurisdiction God gave me. When you look at this and realize we have arrived at that place truly, it's time for you to go back and check through every giant. See the patterns. See the connections. See the different issues. Because people, we've reached at that place where the word cannot be stopped. We've reached the place where God is keeping his word to establish you, to bring you to the place of fullness, the power to create wealth will work for you. 
Hiram will bring you timber. He'll bring you cedar. He'll bring you whatever you need to establish that which God has given you. What is crucial? Never lose the place of buying the threshing floor. Because on that the temple will be. For where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. This is why I say, keep it kingdom. Keep it kingdom.